Hi, Kathy here. In our last video, we looked at some of the changes that were starting to happen in Italian art in the 14th century, some ideas that were stirring that promised a new approach to art that would result in the flowering of the Renaissance. This week, we finally arrived at that point, the 1400s, aka the 15th century, or as art historians like to call it, the Quattrocento. Again, a shortened form of the Italian Mille Quattrocento, or 1400s. We'll be looking at some work that should strike you as contrasting strongly with Gothic art and architecture, except before we do, it's important to note that even in the relatively small region of Europe, the Renaissance didn't happen all at once. Gothic architecture in particular was a very compelling style. In England especially, a highly refined version of the Gothic style, perpendicular Gothic, continued to develop right into the 16th century. While the High Renaissance was going on in Italy, King's College Chapel in Cambridge is a great example of this well-named perpendicular style, really emphasizing an exaggerated soaring height. We said the Gothic period was an age of faith. We looked at a lot of cathedrals in that lecture, and certainly Christianity did not come to a screeching halt in Europe when the Renaissance began. A lot of what we'll look at today is still going to be church architecture and depictions of Bible stories and Catholic saints. We'll see a lot of Madonnas, but we will start to see some changes there too in attitudes towards religion and art's role in expressing religious faith and who pays for even religious art. What I'd like you to watch out for in today's images is the spirit of rebirth. And we're really talking about the rebirth of classical or Greek Roman ideals. How did 15th century Europeans know about classical ideals? Well, thanks to the church, Latin continued to be the language of scholars throughout the Middle Ages. Even though it wasn't spoken as a vernacular language, many scholars delighted in studying the Latin texts of antiquity, Cicero, Virgil, and even older Greek texts that had been translated into Latin in antiquity, Homer, Plato. The scholars who studied them began in a rather dramatic shift to be infected, if you will, by their pre-Christian ideas, whereas in the Gothic period, the Greeks and Romans were more or less pitied as being born too soon to be Christians. Now scholars began to revere their accomplishments and to emulate the ancients' spirit of inquiry into science, mathematics, and the natural world. These scholars were called humanists because they emphasized the potential and agency of individual human beings rather than their sinfulness and dependence on God. At first, though, it was just a question of emphasis. Humanism and Christianity were not seen as mutually exclusive. Dante, for example, wrote his Divine Comedy, A Soul's Journey Through Hell, the Inferno, Purgatory, which is sort of a halfway station between hell and heaven, the Purgatorio, and heaven, the Paradiso. His long three-book-length poem lays out and elaborates on basic Christian dogma. But Dante's companion and guide throughout the journey to the Christian paradise is Virgil, the pre-Christian Latin author he admired above all others. Dante, despite being such a great Latinist, chose to write his divine comedy, not in Latin, but in the Tuscan dialect of Italian that was spoken in his native Florence. Others followed his precedent, establishing by the time of the Renaissance the first body of vernacular literature, accessible at least when read aloud to anyone, not just a tiny group of scholars. Dante is a medieval figure. Remember, we saw in the last lecture that he put Enrico Scrovegna's father in hell for usury in his Inferno, but he was one of the late medieval humanist scholars who started this process by pointing to Greece and Rome. This is Giotto's portrait of Dante. They were contemporaries. It's apparently extensively restored, but it was painted during Dante's lifetime when they were both in Florence, so very likely from life, since we know that's how Giotto liked to work. We saw how in Giotto's painting in the last lecture, that desire to study nature and work from life was definitely a sign of the rebirth of classical ideas because the Greeks studied nature. In Northern Europe, that fascination with the natural world really began to take off with a sudden interest in landscape. Remember we said that whereas landscape painting in the East 
China, Japan had been an established art form for centuries. In the West, it was not considered a worthy subject for painting until now. We saw how illuminated prayer books had been popular during the Middle Ages among nobility who could afford to commission them. By the early 1400s, the painters of Northern Europe were really seeing these as an opportunity to show off their skill and rendering of reality. The three Limburg brothers, Paul, Hermann, and Jean Limburg would have been a reference to their home region. This was commonly used in the 15th century rather than a surname, a last name. The Limburg brothers were probably the most famous team of illustrators in the Netherlands. These tiny, detailed gems of landscape painting appear as calendar pages in their Très Riche Ur, the very sumptuous book of hours of the Duke of Berry, created in 1413 to 16. February shows farm laborers warming themselves before a fire, beehives, lots of detail here. Fencing, you feel like you could make a fence by this method, it's so carefully rendered. A thicket of wood being chopped for fuel, wonderful landscape detail. Tiny town in the distance. The calendar page for August shows us a group of nobility with their falcons soaring around them. And this would have been quite typical to, to alternate between showing the peasants working and the nobles having a good time, I suppose. November, my own favorite, shows us a swineherd in front of a wonderful landscape, a sea view here through forest trees with a castle thrown in for good measure. In all of these, but November in particular, I think, we see the first signs of atmospheric perspective that we've seen so far in Western painting. Remember how good at it the Chinese were by this time? You still don't see it farther south in Italy for a while, but this Northern European fascination with observing landscape from nature quickly yielded a realization that colors, contrast, and edges get softer as they do back here in the ocean and mountain in the distance. Details get less vivid as you look back into deep space. Let's take a look at sculpture, too. This marvelous piece in Dijon, France, by Klaus Sluter, from the very early years of the 15th century, the turn of the century, really, was originally only the base of a much more elaborate sculptural group, portraying a large freestanding crucifixion with figures of the Virgin Mary, Mary Magdalene, the Apostle John, the very ungothic freestanding figures that were originally above this base were destroyed during the French Revolution. But these supporting sculptures that remain show how far Sluter had come from the Gothic tradition towards the new spirit of naturalism. The Old Testament figures surrounding the Well of Moses, while not freestanding, are pretty close to it, and they are portrayed as distinct individuals with distinct psychologies. Their drapery, in particular, is very ungothic, with its swirling volumes giving the figures mass and energy. And while we're in Northern Europe, let's take a look at panel painting. Painters in the Netherlands and what's now Belgium, Flemish, we call them after the province of Flanders, love to paint on movable wooden panels, as opposed to the common practice of painting on walls that we've been seeing in Italy. Even paintings for churches were generally painted on wood panels rather than directly on the walls. The Northern European painters also had developed the use of oil paint, which allowed for much greater detail than the tempera used in fresco. So we'll see some of these Flemish painters really glorying in that. For example, in this work by Robert Campan, the Merod altarpiece, for all its amazing detail, it's quite small, about four feet wide when it's open like this. The wings on either side would have folded up to cover the central panel. The middle panel shows the Annunciation, the moment when the angel tells Mary that she will be the mother of Christ. Campan's ability to create all that fine detail is put to use by filling the painting chock full of hidden symbols, readily understood by his contemporaries. The white towel hanging on the wall symbolizes Mary's purity. The hanging water pot, look at its tiny, precise reflections and its shadow on the wall. That symbolizes her role as the vessel for Christ's coming into the world. Her husband, Joseph, is shown over here in his carpentry shop on the right panel, and the donor 
and his wife kneel and observe the scene over here on the left through a door. Although there is no consistent vanishing point yet, the spaces are legible and ambitiously deep, much deeper than anything you'd have seen in Gothic art. And in each panel, there's at least some beautiful reference to nature, a garden, a view outside the window. Even in Mary's room, the tiny section of sky is so beautifully painted darker at the top and lighter towards the horizon as the sky appears in life. Let's move on to someone you should recognize. Remember Jan Van Eck. Here's his Madonna of Chancellor Roland again. You looked at this with innocent eyes a couple of weeks ago. Let's look at it now in the light of what you've been learning and see if it looks any different to you. First of all, the subject. Before you were speculating, now I'll tell you that the man on the left is Mr. Roland, the donor, who commissioned this painting from Van Eck to hang in his parish church in Autun, France. The church later burned down, but the painting was rescued. One good reason to paint on panels rather than walls, I'd say. The space itself, very elaborate and convincing, though still not quite using a consistent perspective system. The figures, for example, are a little too large for the space. So if Chancellor Rollins stood up, He'd find himself unexpectedly close to those arches, and he'd have to bend down a bit to squeeze through them. Speaking of the size of the figures, did you notice that he and Mary are about the same size? This was true of the donors in that altarpiece that we just looked at as well. That's a new idea, right? Compared to the Gothic practice we were still seeing in those medieval and Trecento paintings we looked at last week. Maybe humanism expressing itself visually giving humans a greater pride of place relative to the divine figures. And what about these arches? Do you recognize them as Roman arches? Even the arches of the bridge out there in the landscape, Roman rather than Gothic. Interesting, right? Another expression of that idea of rebirth that we're looking for, going back to the ideals of ancient Rome as opposed to the upstart Gothic architecture. I want to show you this landscape up close because several of you had questions about these two tiny figures. There was some speculation that they might be children. And I had to agree that their heads seem disproportionately large and therefore childlike. I discovered that they are adults, however, adults wearing the super large headgear of the day, a turban-like hat called a chaperon, really a combination of hat and cape. The figure in the red chaperone on the right here may even be Van Eck's self-portrait. When you zoom in, I believe, maybe you'll agree that they really do look like adults, just with very large hats. You'll notice that the landscape painting here takes the atmospheric perspective of the Limburg brothers and pushes it even farther with quite a haze over the farthest parts of the landscape. Look at these beautiful mountains, way, way in the back, miles away. There's incredible detail in this observed space. The elaborate cathedral on the right, see that? The reflections in the water. So we have a thoroughly modern painting here, showing the birth of the Renaissance in Northern Europe with its humanist approach to the figure, a real portrait of a strong-minded individual. We'd recognize him on the street, right? Especially with a haircut. The figure equivalent in size to Mary, shown in a believable space, with close observation of nature. Out of all this, though, I think the thing most people take away from Van Eck is his incredible skill, mostly manifested in the way he rejoices in detail. Look at this close-up of the pillars in the background. He actually rendered these so carefully that scholars can tell exactly what Bible stories were being represented here. The expulsion of Adam and Eve from paradise is this one. Cain's murder of Abel. Noah's drunkenness. Even more impressive to me is the effect of light and shadow on this patterned robe of the chancellors. I mentioned that one of the reasons Van Eck could achieve these effects is his use of oil paint. It takes longer to dry than the tempera that was used in Italy at the time, days as opposed to hours, so there was much more working time. And oil, because it can be used transparently, allows for layering. Van Eck perfected a system of underpainting and glazes. He typically would render his whole painting in grisaille, grayscale, remember, 
getting the drawing, the lightnesses, the lights and shadows the way he wanted them, and then add the color in a second stage, going over his underpainting with layers of transparent glazes. Van Eck's Ghent Altarpiece is one of his most famous works. It's his earliest known work that still exists. In fact, it is thought the work may have been begun by Jan's older brother and finished by Jan himself. And what a testament to his skill. This is what the painting looks like when the altarpiece is open. You can see that it's hinged, just like that marode altarpiece that we look like, only this one is more complex, of course. It would only have been opened one day a year on Easter to give you an idea of the treasure-like quality of this brilliantly complex painting inside of it. The basically symmetrical composition seats God, Mary, and John the Baptist at the top with angel musicians flanking them and Adam and Eve, of course, on the sides. And below is an illustration of the communion of the saints based on the Bible's description of Jesus as a sacrificial lamb. You can see the lamb there in the center of this landscape being worshiped by crowds of believers. Incredible detail in the landscape and the portrait-like studies of each individual figure. Let's look at the Adam and Eve figures. See the little grisaille paintings above their heads? More Bible stories. We get the killing of Abel again. But what I'd like you to notice is the way the figures of Adam and Eve are very much like the grisailles. The little grisaille paintings have been left in grayscale to suggest that they are sculptures. If you imagine Adam and Eve in grayscale, and then Van Eck painting over them with warm brown glazes, very transparent, you can perhaps get a feeling for the way he would progress from an underpainting to the final rendering. The figures who happen to be wearing clothing, of course, would get more brilliant coloring, but by the same technique. Here's the altarpiece closed. And you can see that Van Eck kept some of these figures in grayscale, again, to suggest that they are sculptures. If you compare the donors here to these trompe l'oeil sculptures in between them, this technique of painting something so carefully that the viewer might be at least for a moment tricked into thinking it's the real thing is called trompe l'oeil or fool the eye. The donors, a wealthy merchant and his wife to continue our Renaissance theme of even ecclesiastical church art being commissioned by secular patrons, they are pictured in the corners. Before we leave the Ghent altarpiece, I'll just mention that it was so popular and beloved that there's a story about the Duke of Burgundy visiting Ghent in 1458. The townspeople, wishing to honor him, greeted him by arranging themselves in small groups, then standing frozen like human statues, like we might see today at street fairs. They were all dressed in costumes, recreating the exact scenes from the Ghent altarpiece, their town's biggest claim to fame sort of a quattrocento flash mob. I like knowing that this piece, which is high art to us, was popular culture to the people of the 15th century. Finally, we can't leave Venek without a look at the Arnolfini double portrait. This has commonly been regarded as a betrothal painting, marriage being generally confirmed with a contract rather than a religious ceremony in the pragmatic 15th century. Recently, an art historian suggested that instead, the picture with its strong feeling of testament from the raised right hand of Mr. Arnolfini may have been a record of his power of attorney, showing that his wife was authorized to act for him while he traveled for business. This illustrates the difficulty of being sure that we interpret the symbolism of another century accurately. But most scholars agree that this painting is packed with symbols, even if we're not quite sure what they all meant to 15th century viewers. The fruit under the window is generally thought to symbolize fertility. The small dog may symbolize loyalty. The convex mirror on the wall may symbolize the all-seeing eye of God. But it definitely has two figures depicted in it. Besides the backs of the Arnolfinis, which you'd expect to see, let's zoom in. There are the uh, backs of the figures in the portrait. 
But in between here, there are two figures reflected as if they are in the position of the viewer. And one of them wears that same red turban that we saw in one of the small background figures in the Chancellor Roland painting, remember? Which is why art historians believe that figure may be the painter himself with the red turban being a sort of trademark. Can't prove that, but it's fun to think of. He signed the piece here, Johannes de Eck, Fuit Hick, 1434. Jan van Eck was here, 1434. And let's zoom back in here to enjoy the tiny scenes from the life of Christ that were painted around the mirror and the shadows and the reflected light from the beads hanging on the wall. Incredible detail, what a guy. One more painter from the Northern European Renaissance before we head south, Rogier van der Weyden. Little is known about his life. Scholars have pieced together what's known of his career from contemporary documents. This painting, the deposition, is known to have been commissioned from van der Weyden by a guild, a crossbow guild. Again, we see the movement of money and power from the nobility and the church to the guilds. Sometime before 1443, which is when the first copy of it was done by another artist. Here we really see the Renaissance interest in the human individual. Look at the faces. The artist makes the reality of death very clear, not just through the tones of the flesh, but through the paleness of the fainting Mary, grief of Christ's stricken friends. Christ and Mary are shown as utter humans among humans, strikingly more so even than in Van Eck's work. Van der Weyden's beautiful portrait of a lady combines the same interest in the individual human likeness with an instinct for idealization, which would have been familiar to the ancient Greeks. This secular portrait, and we'll start to see lots of these now with the Renaissance, combines a feeling of extreme particularity with a vision of the woman as an idealized beauty, one that she would have been flattered by, I imagine, but not so over-the-top flattered that she couldn't immediately recognize herself, looking her best. This modest portrait has a stunning composition. The abstract shape of the transparent headgear, I love the way it just kisses the side of the rectangle on the left as the hands do on the bottom. The flame-like red of the belt warming the canvas and calling out to the one other patch of warmth, these full lips. Just an exquisite composition, reserved but so quietly full of humanity. One of the great paintings. According to Marilyn Stockstad's art history, I'm quoting, more names of artists were recorded during the 15th century than in the entire span from the beginning of the common era to the year 1400. This to me is one of the great effects of humanism. Not only were artists becoming more interested in painting portraits, and in painting individual human beings in a similar scale and a continuous pictorial space with Christ and Mary and other divine figures, they were also becoming very interested in being known as individuals themselves. We saw Van Eck signing his painting, for example, quite centrally and even flamboyantly, the Arnolfini double portrait. And this is the point where you're really going to notice that there will be a lot of names of artists in your glossary for each lecture. Because as artists began to think of themselves, and as their patrons began to think of them as uniquely gifted, creative individuals, fine artists as opposed to artisans, their names began to matter to affect the price of artwork, for example, and thus to be recorded. We're now finally moving to the heart of the Renaissance, Florence, and much of what we know about the artists we're going to be talking about now comes from a book I mentioned in the last lecture, Giorgio Vasari's Lives of the Most Excellent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects. The Lives, as it's known, was first published in 1550. And I should say right up front that Vasari was writing about artists from a span of well over 200 years. Some were his contemporaries, but some were long dead. He didn't have libraries or archives, let alone Google, to help him with his research. 
His biographies of older artists are basically stories that had long circulated, and frankly, even his biographies of his contemporaries appear to have been embroidered in many cases. So keep that in mind. Vasari's stories range from biography to gossip and, frankly, fiction. We're obviously lucky to have the stories, though, and The Lives gives a fascinating look into what it was like to be an artist in the 13th through 16th centuries. One thing that's quite striking is his repeated reference to competition, with artists' names becoming known and individuality being cultivated, a sense of competition inevitably arose. If artists were individual creative geniuses and painting and sculpture was no longer a mere artisan's trade available from any member of a reputable guild, but a liberal art, a fine art, then Patrons wanted to spend their money on the very best, and perhaps even to keep those artists close, working especially for them. One of the earliest competitions we know of is the competition for the baptistry doors in Florence in 1402. The baptistry is the oldest building in Florence's cathedral complex. You'll recognize its Romanesque construction with the round Roman arches, so I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that it was built in 1059. Between 1059 and about 1128, it was covered with a beautiful patterned green and white marble that you see here. And in the 14th century, Andrea Pisano was commissioned to create relief sculptures for the doors. Here's another example of the tendency to name artists by their town. Andrea from Pisa, in this case, Andrea Pisano. There was no competition that we know of, but he did a great job. This detail shows John the Baptist, to whom the baptistry was dedicated, naturally, baptizing people in the wilderness, and here on the right, baptizing Christ himself, as he famously did in the Bible story. But in 1402, the wealthy and powerful Cloth Importers Guild decided to commission another door, and this time they held a competition. The most gifted and brilliant sculptors competed, and it must have been very hard to decide. The jury finally narrowed it down to two, intending them to work together, Lorenzo Ghiberti and Filippo Brunelleschi. Brunelleschi was insulted not to be the only one chosen, and he declined to have anything to do with, with the commission and went off to Rome in a huff to study architecture. More of him later. Ghiberti, who was then 21 years old, went on to create the doors himself. The north doors resemble Pisano's work, reflecting the youthful sculptor's deference to the existing doors. They were such a success that he was later awarded another commission for the third set of doors. On the east doors, his masterwork, he clearly felt more independent and able to approach the scenes he was depicting with the new sense of deep space so characteristic of the Florentine Renaissance. I was recently in Florence, and it was wonderful to see these again. I lived there for a year, many years ago, and I'm afraid I sort of got to take these doors for granted. These are the doors that Michelangelo called the gates of paradise. And this detail shows the astonishing change in his approach. First of all, we have linear perspective going on here. The orthogonals, in the ceiling here, those diagonals going back, meet at a vanishing point. The relief has striking differences in depth with the far background layers being almost drawn. The building arches layered over each other in increasing depth, and you'll notice those are Roman arches. And the figures in the foreground undercut so deeply that they almost feel like freestanding sculpture in the round. While Ghiberti was working on his first set of doors, Brunelleschi, the loser of the door competition, was off in Rome, remember, studying Roman architecture. His interest in a rebirth of classical ideals was typical of artists of his time. The spirit of the time was a rejection of stiff medieval formalism and a return to the naturalism and humanism of ancient Greece and Rome. Brunelleschi couldn't just go to college to study architecture. He went right to the source to measure, draw, and learn the lessons of the ancient buildings all over Rome under his own steam. 
When he returned to Florence, he began to design buildings like the Foundling Hospital, with its simple Roman arches, columns, and capitals. We'll show you a detail of those, a beautiful classic reference. It was the first building in Florence to really refer back so fully and powerfully to classical antiquity, the building style of ancient Rome. Lots of other big commissions followed, and finally, Brunelleschi got his own back. There was a competition for an architect to design and build the dome of Florence's cathedral, Santa Maria del Fiore. His old nemesis, Ghiberti, was up against him again, but this time Brunelleschi won. In the Renaissance, of course, it was common for artists to be architects, for painters to be sculptors, for engineers to be all of those things. In fact, the bell tower of the cathedral, you see it over here on the left, had been designed by our old friend, the painter Giotto. In this view, you see the freestanding bell tower on the left. When Giotto designed it in 1334, the cathedral itself was much smaller with all this right end not yet built. A giant dome, 80 meters high, had long been planned, but when it came time to build it, no one could quite figure out how. The dome was planned to be bigger than anything in Europe, bigger than the Pantheon even. The problem was that there were no timbers long enough to create scaffolding to support the bricks while the mortars set over such a great span which is how domes had been constructed in living memory. Brunelleschi solved the problem by building two domes, one within the other. The inner dome uses bricks laid in a herringbone pattern, which he had observed in Rome, but which had apparently been forgotten for a millennium. He left no plans or written designs, but it is believed that this lighter structure inside was able to be self-supporting as it went up thanks to the herringbone masonry pattern and bands of interlocking stone and wood like hoops on a barrel which ring the base and more of which may be hidden hypothetically inside the masonry. Over this thin inner dome, he created the heavier outer dome which protects it and is supported by it. He even had to invent the hoisting machine which got the bricks up there based on his research into Roman machines used in the first century on the Roman buildings he'd been studying. Somehow, he managed to get four million bricks into perfect place, the whole structure rising brick by brick, staying perfectly symmetrical and meeting at the top, using Florentine workers who were used to having wine with lunch. He did insist that their wine be watered, however. And in fact, he had their lunch, complete with the watered wine, brought up to them so that they wouldn't waste their energy climbing up and down the ladders. If all Brunelleschi had done was build the Duomo, it would be impressive, right? But that's not all. In his free time, Brunelleschi invented linear perspective, which we'll get to in just a minute. I'm thinking the moral here is don't get discouraged just because you lose one competition. Brunelleschi's younger friend, the sculptor Donatello, is believed to have gone with him on that two-year visit of inspiration to Rome. Donatello also returned with a striking new approach to sculpture and will use his most famous piece, his David, as an example. You've been watching sculpture go from low relief in the Middle Ages to higher relief to sculptures on Gothic cathedrals that were part of the church architecture, although they seemed almost freestanding. But what you're seeing here is the first known nude freestanding sculpture that had been created since the time of the Greeks and Romans. Not only is it freestanding, but it is nude. Well, almost. Yes, David is a Bible figure, but this is not the ecclesiastical church sculpture we've been seeing in the Gothic period. This was commissioned by Cosimo de Medici, the powerful and wealthy founder of the Medici family, who would effectively rule Florence throughout most of the Renaissance. Cosimo wanted a sculpture of David for his palace, not to teach people a Bible story, but as a symbol of civic virtue, represented by the scrappy young hero David, overcoming irrationality and brutality, represented by the giant Goliath. 
David became a symbol for the city of Florence itself. And we'll see that in the next century, Michelangelo would return to this theme, creating another famous image of the young hero David. Donatello's David is much more like a Greek or Roman sculpture of an athlete than any of the religious sculpture we've seen so far, right? We'll turn to painting now and Brunelleschi's invention of linear perspective. He clearly wasn't the only one in his circle who was working on the problem, but according to our friend Vasari, he was the first to demonstrate it in a painting which unfortunately no longer exists. The principles of linear perspective, the fact that parallels appear to recede to vanishing points on the artist's eye level, transformed painting, not only by allowing artists to paint what they saw more accurately, but by giving them a way to paint imagined spaces convincingly. This is the first known painting that uses linear perspective in a careful and systematic way, Masaccio's Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity are God the Father, the Holy Spirit shown as a dove, and the crucified Christ. The other figures are Mary, the Apostle John, and the two donors in the lower corners here. Masaccio was friends with Brunelleschi and Donatello and was quick to learn their technique, which was about to spread like wildfire from Italy throughout Europe and, of course, the whole world. He uses a low eye level here to give viewers the feeling that the figures really are up there within a niche in the church wall above them. He needs only one vanishing point since he set up his architectural depiction with only one set of parallels receding into space. He actually drove a nail into the spot just below the foot of the cross to attach a chopped string and snap the lines of that coffered ceiling above the figures up here for his drawing. But nail hole or not, the vanishing point is easy to see because all the receding parallels point to it. Masaccio studied Giotto extensively and also made a trip to Rome at the urging of his friends Brunelleschi and Donatello. This painting called The Tribute Money illustrates a Bible story in which the disciples worry about having no money to pay the tax or the tribute, and Christ here tells his apostle, his head apostle, Peter, here to go fishing. Peter goes fishing, finds the money inside the fish, and is able to pay the tribute, which we see him doing over here. So here again, we see that same technique that Giotto used, showing the same figure more than once to tell the story more efficiently. To me, Masaccio's modeling of the figures in light and shade, his deep space, shows the culmination of generations of painters trying to do what Giotto did. No one ever comes closer than Masaccio. And now with the new perspective technique, everything will change. Deep space suddenly becomes accessible to all painters for good or ill, no matter how gifted they are. Before we move on though, let's take a look at Masaccio's Adam and Eve from the same cycle of paintings. Before we move on though, let's take a look at Masaccio's Adam and Eve from the same cycle of paintings in a church, Santa Maria del Carmine, but commissioned as we're getting used to seeing by a wealthy secular patron, Felice Brancacci, for his chapel. He got naming rights to it, I suppose. You see them here before and after the frescoes were cleaned in the 1980s. Masaccio's figures are nude. No fig leaves were necessary in his opinion, just as a Greek or Roman sculptor would have scorned to add fig leaves to a nude. Masaccio, in the humanist spirit that was being reborn in Florence, wanted to celebrate the human body without shame. We see here his dramatic chiaroscuro, or light and shadow technique. The Italian words chiaro and oscuro mean light and dark, and chiaroscuro refers to this way of modeling form in directional light without using outlines. And you see the brilliant highlights and the very dark shadows on the figures, especially on Adam, a technique that takes Giotto's three-dimensionality even one step farther, I think. I should mention at this point that Masaccio, like Giotto before him and like many other Italian painters, worked in fresco, a very different technique from the oil paint of the Northern Europeans like Van Eyck. In fresco, 
the artist put a careful sketch on the wall, and then each day a section of the wall would be covered with a thin layer of plaster called the intonaco, just as much as the artist could paint in one day. The artist had about seven to nine hours to apply paint to the fresh plaster. Any unpainted intonaco that was left had to be chipped off before the next day's was laid because the paint would only set permanently into fresh plaster. The technique yields a certain look, which you may come to recognize. It forces artists to work very quickly, for one thing, and to use water-based paints, which tend to be more opaque and less brilliantly pigmented than oil paint. Thus, fresco paintings tend to be broader in technique and to rely on composition and skillful drawing as opposed to elaborate textures and detail. And the color palette of fresco tends to be a bit softer. We'll really see that in Fra Angelico's work. Fra Angelico was a Dominican friar. Fra is short for fratello, a brother. So his name means the angelic brother. He was a well-established painter when his order, the Dominican order, moved him to Florence to their convent of San Marco. There he met Cosimo de' Medici, who kept a cell for himself in the convent, just a few minutes' walk from his palace, for when he needed to retreat from the world of wealth and privilege, I guess. Vasari tells us that it was Cosimo who urged Fra Angelico to decorate the cells and walls of the convent, and he did. This annunciation, the angel telling Mary she is to be Christ's mother, a scene we've seen painted and sculpted several times now, is one of the great beauties of the place. If you can ever get to Italy, if you can ever get to Florence, I would say one of the most transcendent experiences you can have is to walk through the monastery of San Marco. Fra Angelico's devotion to God lights up every painting. They are filled with a kind of stillness that is his alone, which you just have to experience by seeing the paintings in the cells. This painting, the most elaborate in the convent, is at the top of a stairway leading to the cells, but in each of the monks' quite tiny little cells. I apologize for the noise my dog is making in the background. <laughs> anyway, in each of the quite tiny little cells, the good brother painted a fresco. Many of these are simpler, and they share a fairly restrained palette. They also often share this odd technique where Fra Angelico paints only the head or the hands of some of the figures rather than the whole body, seeming to mean that they are not really meant for solid presences, but perhaps spiritual reminders or symbols. In this one, showing Christ blindfolded and being tormented by his executioners before his crucifixion, there's just a head spitting on him just a hand slapping him as if Fra Angelico couldn't bear to paint the whole figure and knew this reminder would be enough for his brother's meditations. In this one, we see a window in this tiny little room at the edge of a, of a very ancient Florentine shutter, I suppose. And uh, that may give you a little bit of a feeling for the scale of these very tiny rooms. The whole width of one end, as I remember, is taken up by the fresco and the window. And the room is not much longer than it is wide, really just a little cell. In this painting of the resurrection, we see that interesting technique. Again, symbols of the passion, the crown of thorns, the kiss of Judas, the nails, money changing hands as Christ is betrayed, appear here in a similar way. They certainly give the paintings a sort of a mystical feeling, perfectly in keeping with their devotional spirit. Accounts of his life say that Fra Angelico never handled a brush without fervent prayer, and that he wept whenever he painted a crucifixion. Filippo Lippi was a priest and a painter, but quite a different character from Fra Angelico. He left his monastery early on, although he was not released from his vows. And as his paintings became popular, he began to lead a fairly eventful life. He received some important commissions from Cosimo de' Medici, 
but Cosimo discovered he had to lock Lippi up in order to get him to work, and even then the painter escaped by climbing out of a window on a rope made of sheets. Lawsuits and scandal seemed to follow him wherever he went, even as he produced these ethereally beautiful paintings of the Madonna. Speaking of the Madonna, his model for this Madonna is traditionally supposed to be Lucrezia Butti, a beautiful novice. In a convent where he happened to be painting frescoes, Lippi asked for permission for her to model for the figure of the Madonna, then seduced her, ran off with her, and kept her at his house despite all the nuns' efforts to reclaim her. The two had a son, Filippino Lippi, who became a famous painter in his own right. Tradition, an unreliable source, but interesting, also says that the model for the mischievous little angel in this painting is Filippino, his son. There are so many more Quattrocento painters and paintings I'd love to introduce you to, but I'll limit myself to two more painters. First, Sandro Botticelli. Botticelli was apprenticed to Lippi, and you may see some similarities in their style. His figures have a similar elegance, very pure contours, and delicate light and shadow, as compared to the robust chiaroscuro of Masaccio, for example. He started by painting religious subjects, just as we've been seeing, but in the 1480s, that changed. Botticelli began painting classical subjects, Roman gods and goddesses, in a full-on embrace of the return to the values and subjects of antiquity. His Primavera, Spring, is an iconic painting, understood at the time to be about the idea of rebirth and the Florentine Renaissance's return to classic ideals. The three dancing graces here in their filmy gossamer scarves, or whatever those are, are about as far from Gothic imagery as you can get, right? This painting and this next one, The Birth of Venus, are certainly Botticelli's best-known works and may be the images that really sum up the idea of the Quattrocento for many people. These paintings would never have existed without the patronage system. It's impossible to imagine paintings like these getting made during the Gothic era because the church would never have commissioned them. Botticelli went on to paint many more religious subjects, particularly Madonnas. Those were obviously still an artist's bread and butter. For this tondo, or circular round painting, the Magnificat Madonna, some art historians believe that Botticelli used Lucrezia Tornabuoni, wife of Piero de' Medici, as his model for Mary. And her two sons, Lorenzo, soon to be known as Lorenzo the Magnificent, and Giuliano for the angels holding her book and inkpot. Whether or not that's true, the story does give a feeling for the kinds of accommodations artists made to their wealthy patrons, even when painting traditional subject matter. Lorenzo, if this is really him, <laughs> whether or not it is really him, went on to be one of the most famous patrons the arts have ever seen. And Giuliano, his brother, being particularly fond of Botticelli's work, gave him even more commissions than Lorenzo did. Towards the end of his life, Botticelli became a follower of a fiery preacher, the Dominican monk Savonarola, who preached against corruption in the church and called for the destruction of secular art and culture. Here's a portrait of him by another monk, Fra Bartolomeo, right about the time of Savonarola's death in 1498. Botticelli actually stopped painting anything at all, even religious subjects, while he was under Savonarola's influence. Savonarola was first excommunicated by the Pope, then finally put to death in Florence in 1498. And after his death, Botticelli apparently did begin to paint again, although he produced relatively little work, being elderly for those times by then. We're going to end with a painter whose work may not be quite as well known to you, Piero della Francesca. He's known today as a painter, but to his contemporaries, he was also known as a mathematician, and his paintings reflect his interest in geometry, I think. 
He was born in Tuscany and studied painting in Florence, likely meeting Brunelleschi, Donatello, and Fra Angelico. Masaccio, who only lived to be 27 years old, would have been dead before Piero's time, but he studied those magnificent frescoes in the Brancacci Chapel and absorbed the lessons of linear perspective as well. Piero's work is always serene, reserved, full of stillness. Its meditative mood reminds me just a bit of Fra Angelico's work, although Piero's figures are much more solid and weighty. That aspect of his work recalls Masaccio, I think. Though he was much commissioned and even called to work in Rome by the Pope, not a lot of his work has survived. Much of his work was in fresco, and many of those have been lost when buildings were destroyed or damaged. Plus, you have to go to Italy to see them, and so he is not as well known as painters who worked on panels. Probably his most famous cycle of frescoes is from a church in Arezzo. The cycle is called The History of the True Cross, and this painting of the Queen of Sheba is one of those storytelling paintings. It tells part of the long and very fanciful history of the cross, where its wood came from, how it was lost and later found. This painting is one of his finest, though, in my opinion, with its serene procession of figures, his typical use of foreshortening in the horses here. This is Pier Piero, the rhythmic alternation of warm, soft reds with cool bluish greens. His Baptism of Christ is painted on a wood panel, but in tempera rather than oil, so it shares a similar technique to the frescoes, although of course on a panel there wouldn't be the pressure to work as quickly as on fresh plaster, but a similar palette, and again the water-based paint. You'll see here again that device of showing the figure more than once is used. This is John the Baptist baptizing Christ. You're really going to get to know your Bible stories studying Italian art. And we see Christ front and center, but also in the back here, taking off his shirt to get ready for his baptism. I particularly love the trees in this painting. Piero paints them from underneath with a real delight in showing how much closer this tree is and painting it like a botanist. I don't know what kind of tree it is, but when I lived in Florence, I had one just like these growing in my garden. So it apparently is common in Tuscany. There was one in the last painting too. I should have pointed it out, but you can go back and look. This is a later painting. This is one of my favorite paintings in the world. This painting almost slows your heart rate as you stand in front of it. It's so completely regally serene. This happens to be painted in oil, which by the late 1400s was working its way down from the north and being used by Italian artists who wanted to paint on panels rather than having to work in fresco all the time. Oil may have made it easier for him to achieve that translucent veil on the Madonna. But Piero sticks to his normal fresco-like palette, still those soft pastel reds and greenish blues on that calm gray background. The room seems to be an ordinary room with sunlight slanting against the wall in the background. The faces, especially of that angel in blue, ah, who's looking right at us. The hands, so beautifully shaped. They're lovely human faces and hands, the way the Madonna is holding the baby's toes. Such a human gesture. It's a good image, I think, to end on. A humanist painting. If we didn't see those tiny bits of wings behind the angels, this could be any young Italian mother standing in her house on a sunny afternoon. Thank you for looking at these with me. I hope you enjoyed this journey through some of what I particularly love from the early Renaissance, the Quattrocento. Next time, we'll look at the 1500s and see where all this goes as we get into the high Renaissance. <laughs>